Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Hello, my friends. Dennis Prager here with you. One of the most difficult things for me to talk about is the damage that a man named Biden is doing to this country. The only thing I'm not certain about is, is it deliberate? Does, does he want to weaken the country? Of course, it doesn't matter. As you know, I am an action judge or not a motive judger. Motives are too complex in general for us to understand and judge. The human being must judge conduct. If he wanted to hurt this country terribly, then he would do what he is doing. So that's, that's the way I will put it. I will give you three examples all from recent reports in the Wall Street Journal. We'll begin with California's assault on trucks. Probably don't know about this because the press is part of the Democratic Party. It's it's as simple as that. An accelerated ban on diesel fleets will wreak havoc on the industry. That's right. Listen to this. Climate policy keeps colliding with economic and technological reality, and California is ground zero. The state's latest efforts is a forced sprint to ban diesel trucks with no concern for costs or consequences. That, of course, is the signal feature of all left-wing thought, and that is that there is as they put it, no thought, are concern for costs or consequences. As Tom Sowell put it, first, stage one thinking. Stage one thinking is the characteristic of the left. I've mentioned to you the great Talmudic, Talmud is the second holiest work of Judaism, written in the early centuries of uh, A.D. or C.E., uh, whichever, whichever initials you use, Common Era or Anno Domini. And there, I learned it as a child, who is the wise man? The answer, the one who sees what will be born. That is a literal translation. In other words, the one who sees the consequences. There is no wisdom on the left, none. It is not possible to be a leftist and wise. You you can be sweet in a personal way, have have friends, love your spouse, all many good things are possible, but you cannot be wise. If you were wise, you'd be a liberal or a conservative, and I mean traditional liberal. This is a This is a perfect example, then. No thought to the consequences on the ban on diesel trucks. Listen to how bad it's going to get. get. Truckers are raising alarms about a new mandate proposed by the California Air Resources Board. CARB. And and I'm essentially on a no-carb diet, so I identify with how bad this is. To electrify their fleets. Starting next year, operators that transport goods between states, ports, and distribution centers would be prohibited from registering new diesel trucks. Starting when? Next year? Americans don't understand that how much of the price 
horrible price hike in food, for example, is r- related to the Greens, many of whom do want to wreck the society. They have a, a, whole, a whole new theory called Beyond Growth, where they're anti-growth. They think that people should just live on less, live in a smaller home, not have a car, not eat meat, etc. The bored affluent of the West. Excuse me. The bored secular affluent of the West. Starting next year, the, the, those who transport goods between the state's ports and distribution centers will be prohibited from registering new diesel trucks. By 2035, almost all package delivery, dryage, and box trucks would have to be zero emission. Now, do you understand, among other things, this will have no effect on the climate? None. None. It is done to wreck the, the way in which the world lives. That is what communists have always wanted to do. They destroy the middle class, boring, bourgeois existence that we have. There is no point to this. It will have no effect. Bjorn Lomborg has pointed this out repeatedly. This is why they, uh, during the time that China is, uh, I don't know why, every month or every two weeks, opening up a new coal mine. That's the same year California's ban on new gas-powered cars takes effect. But electrifying trucks will be even more costly and difficult. A mere 272 electric trucks were registered in California as of last year. (laughs) And starting next year, no new truck. Every new truck has to be electric. Electric. How far will an electric truck go? On the CARBs mandate, some 510,000 trucks would have to be zero emission by 2035 in under 12 years. Here is a classic example of regulating first and thinking later. Start with the costs. Electric heavy-duty trucks are about three times more expensive than new diesel big rigs. You hear that? Who's going to be able to buy that? Since the ports of California are entryways to all of America, this is going to hurt the economy all over the country. Goods will be so much more expensive. Trucking companies will go out of business. Who is going to make a new trucking company when a truck is three times more expensive? And worse, and it's a worse truck. The Inflation Reduction Act, that is Orwellian, all it did was increase inflation. Tax credits will offset only $40,000 of the $400,000 to $500,000 cost. Really? Who's going to buy a truck for $400,000? Go 290 miles. So it's not towing anything. It right. stops for more than half an hour. Installing chargers can cost millions of dollars and requires coordination with charging equipment makers and local utilities. That's another, right? Every 200-something miles. This is not including towing, which halves, it, halves the number, I am told. Trucks suck up loads of power, which can destabilize the electric grid. Grid. That's right. <laughs> Life in California will become untenable, as it has already in San Francisco. It, it, it's so vicious. It's such senseless destruction. 
Mm. Charging a small trucking fleet can require three times more power than a factory and is about as much juice as a shopping mall or sports stadium. Where are we going to get all of that electric from? Wind is going to power a trucking fleet? One trucking company wanted to install charging stations for 30 trucks at a terminal in Joliet, Illinois, only to be told by local officials they would draw more power than the entire city. In January, Northern California utility PG&E told a charging provider that one of its large fleet customers couldn't charge its trucks on summer afternoons, owing to a power crunch. Okay, this is only one of three immediate damages. Gold dealers are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. What sets these companies apart and whom can you really trust? This is Dennis Prager for AmFed Coin and Bullion. My choice for buying precious metals. When you buy precious metals, it's imperative that you buy from a trustworthy and transparent dealer that protects your best interests. So many companies use gimmicks to take advantage of inexperienced gold and silver buyers. Be cautious of brokers offering free gold and silver or brokers that want to sell you overpriced collectible coins, claiming they appreciate more than gold and silver. What about hidden commissions and huge markups? Nick Grovich and his team at AmFed always have your back. I trust this man. That's why I mention him by name. Nick's been in this industry over 42 years, and he's proud of providing transparency and fair pricing to build trusted relationships. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick Grovich and his team at AmFed Coin and Bullion, 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com. AmericanFederal.com. The destruction of the country by the Greens, it goes unnoted because the press is is virtually all left-wing. This uh, mandate, this law, I mean, it, it's unbelievable. We'll have to go to diesel trucks in California. You realize how bad things are, that what it'll do to the grid that no no trucking company can afford a a truck that costs three times as much to do nothing to do nothing a southern california edison executive recently said some fleets are powering chargers using diesel generators so electric trucks don't go unused this captures the folly of california's climate policies Who cares if policies don't reduce CO2 emissions or improve public health as long as regulators claim they do? It gets more ridiculous. As of last month, as a Wall Street Journal editorial, there were fewer than 700 chargers at trucking depots, yet California's Energy Commission estimates 157,000 more will be needed for medium and heavy-duty trucks by 2030. That's six years, six and a half years and four months. This would require more than 450 to be constructed every week. You think inflation's bad now? Thanks to the damn greens, these these sickos, these hysterics, and of course the Democratic Party, the most damaging major institution in American history. It's always been damaging. This was the slavery party. The history of the Democratic Party with few exceptions, is disgusting. Then there's the weight problem. Electric trucks run on two batteries that each weigh about 8,000 pounds. Since trucks must comply with strict federal weight limits, they won't be able to carry as large a load as diesel big rigs. PepsiCo this year is deploying Tesla's electric semi-truck to deliver Frito-Lay products, but the trucks can't go as far as delivering soda. It's all done to hurt to hurt America. Do you understand? The entire purpose, conscious or not, is to damage the country. These are bored, sick, secular, wealthy people. Who do you think make up the environmentalist movement? Poor Chicanos? It's a sick movement. And it will mean nothing 
and people will continue to vote Democrat as they pay more and more and get less and less. And they will be lied to by the Los Angeles Times and the San Francisco Chronicle and the other lying left-wing newspapers. Lying left-wing is redundant. What will they say the reason that you have fewer things at much greater prices? They'll blame it on Trump, but I don't, re- I don't exactly know how. Oh, the war in Ukraine, perhaps. <sighs> Among the losers will be independent contractors who won't be able to afford electric trucks. Some may retire or leave the state. This could disrupt supply chains. California's ports process about 40% of U.S. imports and 30% of exports. Recall how a shortage of truck drivers two years ago contributed to a backup at the state's ports. And finally, shippers will invariably pass on their electric truck costs to customers around the country. So Americans in Joliet will have to pay more for whatever travels by truck while the U.S. Constitution grants states police powers to regulate public health and safety. Congress can preempt states that regulate recklessly outside of their lane. The current Congress is too gridlocked to pass anything, but GOP candidates could start talking about California's climate assault on truckers. I'm quiet because I, I, I am so aware that 95% of people living in California have no clue as to what I just read. No idea of what's in store for them to utterly disrupt their lives. And for that matter, since the amount of imports and exports of the whole country come through California, what will happen? It's all feel-good drivel. And the proof, of course, is that they're against nuclear power. The whole thing could be solved with nuclear power. The whole thing but they won't do it because they don't want a solution. They want destruction. Everything the left touches, it destroys. That's that's a fact, not an opinion. Sometimes I admit I'm going to go a little off the beaten track here. I wish we could appeal to a supernatural judge. Oh, God in heaven, who's right? I know who's right, but that would be, that would be helpful, I admit. However, I also think it would make no difference to the left. If God himself said, you know, you're destroying the family, you're destroying children, you're destroying schools, you're destroying the economy, you're destroying people's savings, it would have no impact. They have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and have decided to be God's. That was the promise of the serpent. You see it before your eyes. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop at the pillow. Mike also created the Giza Dream bed sheets. These sheets look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep, which is crucial for overall health. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's latest deal is the sale of the year for a limited time. You'll receive 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets, marking prices down as low as $29.98, depending on the size. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the Radio Podcasts Square, and use the promo code Prager. There you'll find not only this amazing offer, but also deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow 2.0 mattress topper, MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and so much more. Call 800-761-6302 or go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code Prager. You're listening to the Dennis Prager Show, you lucky... 
did they say? Lucky dog? You lucky dog, you. I haven't heard that phrase in about half my lifetime. Well, I gave you one example of what the Democrats are doing to destroy the country. Another example. This ban on diesel fleets. Uh, It's inconceivable that it won't have massive damage. Means everything that you care about will be more expensive, way more expensive. It won't get to you. Truck drivers will be laid off because they just can't have as many trucks. They cost three times as much. They weigh tons more because of their battery. They don't even mention the what that does to roads. Having even heavier trucks go on roads doesn't matter. Once you ask what what are the consequences, you are no longer a leftist. Consequences don't matter. Next. In the uh, in the, in the list of uh, of tragic stuff. This is all done in the last month. Here's another one. Again, a Wall Street Journal editorial. A gift to Putin. No uranium mining near the Grand Canyon. A new government land grab makes the U.S. more dependent on Russia. With a stroke of his pen, President Biden walled off from development nearly a million acres of land that includes some of America's richest uranium deposits. See, this is, this is why I do believe that there is an intention to wreck this country because they believe that after the wreckage, they will have more power. There is no explanation other than wreck our society for this example. A million acres of land that includes some of America's richest uranium deposits. This is another monument to the administration's destructive energy policy. Destructive. Destructive? That's correct. There is nothing constructive about the left. The Antiquities Act of 1906 lets presidents set aside federal land for national monuments to protect historic objects. Barack Obama used the law to remove millions of acres of federal land from oil and gas development. See, that's that's it. That's what they do. What does this have to do with protecting monuments, historic objects? Nothing. They use the law for a completely different purpose. Yet even Obama resisted progressive calls to set aside uranium-rich land outside the Grand Canyon. Mr. Biden shows no such restraint. He declared a national monument on 1,562 square miles in Arizona called Baj and Wavjo Leta Kukveni. You all know about that. Meaning where tribes roam. The monument will conserve, quote, landscapes sacred to tribal nations and indigenous peoples and advance President Biden's historic climate and conservation agenda. Really? Wow. So where will we get uranium that we need? We'll find out. The statement omits that the land also includes America's only, only source of high-grade uranium ore that is economically competitive on the global market. The U.S. imports about 95% of uranium used for nuclear power reactors, mostly from Kazakhstan, Canada, Russia, and Australia. Russia is the U.S.'s third biggest uranium source. We have uranium for nuclear reactors, but we're dependent upon other countries, including Kazakhstan and Russia. Mr. Biden banned imports of Russian fossil fuels by executive order last spring, but U.S. nuclear plants continue to rely on Russian uranium for 12% of their fuel supply. The new national monument, the fifth of the Biden presidency, will make it that much harder for the U.S. to replace Russian uranium. Vladimir Putin sends his thanks. The unstated purpose of the national monument appears to be block 
uranium mining. That's exactly right. That's what it is. It's not about indigenous tribes. Arizona Democrat Representative Paul Grijalva has proposed legislation that would permanently withdraw the Grand Canyon area from new mining claims. Democrats couldn't pass this through Congress, so Mr. Biden is doing so by decree. And they said that Trump was a dictator. We go. Dennis Prager here. So I've read to you about the diesel truck mandate. And now based on the Antiquities Act of 1906, he's taking more and more land away from mining essentials. Progressives want to block all mining in the U.S., including for critical minerals such as lithium and nickel that are needed to power their green energy transition. That means mining will occur in countries with fewer environmental protections. They don't give a damn. There is currently no limit to a president's power under the Antiquities Act to remove land from development and public use. Environmental groups even argue that presidents can't roll back predecessors' designations. This interpretation of one-way executive power is more sweeping than the Grand Canyon and is crying out for a legal challenge. So that was the second deliberate harm to this country. And now for a third one. This is all in the last month, these editorials. Washington stages stages a peacetime fiscal blowout. Interest on federal debt has hit 15.5% of all federal revenue. 15.5% of everything that comes into the government is just paying off the debt on what we owe. The immoral, destructive spending... Both parties have done it, but the Democrats, of course, more, and Biden the worst. Congratulations of a perverse sort to President Biden and his congressional comrades. The latest budget figures show that they are breaking peacetime, non-crisis records for spending and deficits. And there's no respite in sight. The Beltway Brethren racked up a deficit of $1.62 trillion for the first 10 months of the fiscal year, according to the Congressional Budget Office's monthly review for July. That's up from $726 billion a year earlier. What's astounding is that this Beltway blowout is happening when the economy is growing. The COVID crisis is passed. And there are no domestic emergencies to address. This is when deficits are supposed to decline, as they did during the economic expansions of the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. Deficits also fell under President Obama after Republicans regained control of the House in 2010. CBO, Congressional Budget Office, lays out the gory details. Revenues have fallen about 10% despite the Democrats' increase in corporate taxes. Individual income tax revenue is down 20%, or about $442 billion. And CBO speculates one reason is smaller capital gains realizations. Soaking the rich doesn't work when the rich aren't making money in the financial markets. Outlays are up 11% for this year, or $473 billion. That's more in spending. And they would have been higher at $536 billion without the shifts in payment timing. Spending lowlights, as opposed to highlights, includes $71 billion more for Mr. Biden's latest student loan non-repayment plan. $71 $71 billion, so that those who pay them off, like my wife, those who pay them off are suckers. That's right. That is what the progressives think if you paid off your student loan. You're a sucker. In fact, there's a good chance you're a Republican. 
I'm curious. You think that the payment of student loans, the repayment, do you think that left and right former students equally pay back their loans? Wouldn't that be interesting to find out? I don't have any data to suggest that it's more likely that a conservative will pay back the loan. But if you had to bet your house, which group would you bet on? Those who believe the government will bail them out or those who don't? So what was that? Let's see, $71 billion. Sucker! That's, that's the motto of the Democratic Party for those who pay their bills. $111 billion more for Social Security, largely for cost of living adjustments, for inflation, which is caused by the government and its energy policies overwhelmingly. And $104 billion for Medicare from higher payment rates and more care. Taxpayers also doled out $52 billion for the spring bailouts of Silicon Valley Bank and others. CBO says Treasury will get much of that back from asset liquidations and higher premiums for deposit insurance. But the failures wouldn't have cost so much if Biden regulators hadn't been so choosy about which institutions they let bid on the falling banks, failing banks. The biggest increase in outlay so far this year has been net interest on the soaring federal debt. A rise of $146 billion to $572 billion. That's 34%. Do you understand that? Just the interest on the national debt per year is $572 billion. That interest total is nearly double all corporate tax revenue so far this year. Yeah. But let's expand the government. More entitlements. That's right. You shouldn't you shouldn't have to pay for daycare or student lunches or breakfasts. We'll be back. <laughs> The Wall Street Journal ends its editorial about the $570 billion a year just on the interest on the debt. This is all the more dismaying because the booming deficit will make it that much harder to raise spending on national defense in a world of growing threats. Student loan write-offs won't stop a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or a North Korean missile attack aimed at Seattle. That's right. The problem is that the three things I've mentioned here, depending on other countries, including bad actors for our uranium, the mandatory conversion to electric trucks which will wreck the trucking industry and therefore massively increase prices on items that come through ports in California which is almost half of the country and the deficit Hmm. this is the problem that was foreseen many years ago. When people know that there are two parties and one will give them more money than the other, most people will vote for the party that gives them more money or more benefits, which is the same thing. And that is the, that is the immediate, or no, the long-term damage. A country cannot survive that where parties compete on how much money they can give to the voter who votes for them, you have essentially 
ended the ability to have a country survive. So what what happens? Chaos. Have you noticed that? Years ago, I came up with an answer to a very hard question. What does the left want? Consciously or not, the answer is chaos. And the, the proof is that they want it to be legal for men to compete in women's sports so long as they say they're women. My friends, go to PragerHighHolidays.net and join me for a very deep religious experience. PragerHighHolidays.net Hello, everybody. It's the Male Female Hour because it is Wednesday. That's why I picked it. Wed, as in wedding, as day. That's not true, but it's cute. Every Wednesday, we talk about men and women. I think it's the most honest talk about men and women in the American media. And one of the reasons is I don't shy away from any subject, and because I am neither a man fan nor a woman fan. I'm a good person fan. There are... Many good men and many good women and many awful men and many awful women. And so it is, and so it has always been. Today's subject is based on perhaps the funniest single cartoon picture I have ever seen. We will put it up at DennisPrager.com. It is not there yet. It was sent to me by Dr. Bob, and I don't know where he found it, but he is a central clearinghouse for the the greatest articles and cartoons. This cartoon, this illustration, shows a man hanging by his neck. The chair is kicked over and on the floor... He has clearly committed suicide by hanging. His wife is looking at his note pinned to his chest, his suicide note. And this is what she said to her dead husband. You misspelled constant criticism. Seeing it is funnier than reading it, but it's funny even just hearing it. (laughs) The cartoon is brilliant. A number of years ago, I came up with a a totally made-up idea, and I said on the air... In one of my throwaway lines that I thought would never be heard or said again, you know, wife in Sanskrit means flaw finder. And it then had a life of its own. There were a fair number of people who believed it, incidentally. So let's talk about that given the cartoon and how many people took my Sanskrit line seriously, what what is in women's nature that prompts them to find flaws in their husband? Not everyone does it, but almost everyone to a certain extent. Some, it's, it's pretty much a laughable joke between them, and in some cases I am sure... It is troubling. I don't have an answer. But first I'm asking you, do you believe that this is accurate? I mean, humor is a very, very big indicator of truth. And the reason we know that is that everybody laughs. Nobody looks at this cartoon. 
of a woman at her suicide man's body hanging from the ceiling with a note on it and saying to him, you misspelled constant criticism. Nobody says, I I don't get it. Why is that funny? Right? Now, if nobody says, I don't get it, it obviously reveals a truth. So where does this come from? And I'm very interested to hear from both men and women on this. 1-8 Prager 776. Sean, I think you should play the jingle. We have not heard the 877 jingle in quite some time. And I think the show is poorer for it. 877-243-777-6. I wonder if there is another talk show in the country that has such a jingle for its phone number. Or... 1-8 Prager 776. 877-243-7776. one Prager 776. So when I reflect on this, it, it has to be close to a universal truth, or as I said, nobody would understand the cartoon. I think that there are a number of factors one is there i think that there is a primal desire in women that their husband be close to perfect this is not a criticism this is it's just a theory And another another one is women notice more things than men do. So, you know, the proverbial socks on the floor. He, he doesn't even know they're on the floor. And for her, they are the residue of a nuclear attack. So it's an in, it's an an interesting question. That's why I'm posing it. Given that, in fact, it is an interesting question. Let's see here, my friends. How many people relate to this? Okay. Not only does he think it appropriate, but he thinks it's by design. Uh, I'll gamble on that because I'm not clear about what that means. Clarksville, Tennessee, and Don, hello. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's by God's design because... What is the Christian, it? What is the it? I think that this scrutiny or finding flaws in their husband, I call it scrutiny. Um, finding flaws in their husband, I think it's not only uh, right, I think it's necessary because I've got blind sides of aspects of me that I really don't see that my wife would. And if I take it in all humility, I need this kind of scrutiny so I would become, as a Christian, more like Christ. But I need, listen, if I put yes people around me in my life, I'm going to end up like Michael Jackson and only have people who agree with me. I need people who bring scrutiny upon my character and my life so I can get it right, so my character character can be conformed to be a better man. That's good. Uh, that's a very uh, a good, good thesis. By the way, Jesus wasn't married. <laughs> so I think there, there may be a lesson there, since he is perfect, so he, he wouldn't need... The scrutinizer. Is that fair to say? 
very fair. Yeah. So uh, what about our male role? So if that's the female's role, what's the male role? The male role is, since she's a weaker vessel, I I need to be um, one who takes the lead and takes charge of matters. Um, And oftentimes women think emotionally, and they need the objective reasoning of a husband to lead them well. Boy, that isn't going to fit well with most of... Yeah, but you see, it's interesting. Nobody, Nobody objects to your saying how... A man needs a woman. Anyway. I'm Dennis Prager. Sorry that we were... I was cut off. Sean was preoccupied with a nuclear attack on the building. I'm sorry. And he saved many lives. So sorry. But it did affect the show. So... I'm talking to you in the Male Female Hour about women's tendency to criticize their man. Exemplified by a hilarious cartoon that we'll be putting up at DennisPrager.com. A guy who's committed suicide, the husband, has a note dangling from his chest. And his wife looks at his dead body hanging from the ceiling. And looks at the note and says... You misspelled constant criticism. (laughs) It's awesome. So where is our man? Is he gone? I guess he's gone. In uh, Tennessee, yeah. So he he had a very interesting view that this is part of the way God made male and female nature. And I don't uh, don't fully object. I don't even object. I don't. I don't object at all now that I think of it. Okay, let's see. New Braunfels, Texas. Tim, hello. Oh, yes, sir. Um, it's a great topic, Dennis, and I was laughing hilariously on, on the... Oh, good. So, in other words, it works even without oh. seeing it. Oh, yeah. When you said uh, you don't, re- you really have to have a picture to make it funny, I disagreed. I was laughing. Oh, good. I I'm glad. Hilarious. <laughs> it is hilarious, yeah. yeah. But, I, but I, I wanted to sum it up, I think, by people coming to grips with the difference between men and women. And one thing that I've noticed over the years, I'm 61 years old, and I, you know, I, my wife comes from a very large family, and we take care of her mother in okay, case she lives with us. And uh, But they have all these other kids, but we are the ones that take care of them. And I noticed that it's always, it seems to me, all my friends, everybody I've ever run into, it's always the man uh, it's always the the wife's mother that lives with them. It's never, in other words, it's never the man's mother living with it. In other words, women would never put up with the mother-in-law living. With them. Interesting. That's an interesting theory. And I've just theory. noticed this, and, and, and we've been, you know, doing it for ten years. And I've so I, it, it, you know, it matters to me. So I, I look and I really try to distill it down and, and crystallize it in my head and i go wow that is so interesting i brought it up to my wife i see andrew do you, do you notice how it's always the the wife's mother women that yes mm-hmm. right always always it's always and so the criticism of the male today is so overwhelming but they just the male just puts up with all this and just has a grin like myself we just put up with it and let it happen but we don't say absolutely not. They're not going to live here, you know. And it just it shows the difference between men and women. I, that's all I can say. And I'm very happily married. I've been married for almost thirty years. And it's a fantastic marriage. Thank you. So it, it, I believe that ideally, in some idealized understanding of marriage, there is. A, a not a symmetry, but a fitting in of the two sexes. So, for example, if you put your fingers in front of you, both hands, and you can put each finger between the other hand's fingers, 
and so they fit perfectly. Or they, you could have them clash. So I, I have I have a fit perfectly idealized image of what is possible. It's not easy, and but it is possible. So the question is, and I'm not going to get into that on this hour during this hour, but what is the equivalent in his, on his part? But the See, if he criticized as much as she, I think it would have a a deleterious effect. Remember the Geico commercial of Honest Abe Lincoln and his wife, who was on the heavy side, asked him, "Do do I look heavy or do I look fat? I don't remember in this dress. And Honest Abe, man who couldn't lie, you know, was was sort of biting his tongue and not knowing what what does he say. Okay, we'll continue. And hmm, any women calling? Let's see. Megan in Orland Park, Illinois. Hello. <laughs> Dennis. Um, So I'm going to point out that my husband, I do have one criticism, but I am super guilty of causing him to have this um, fault, if you will. And that is, I talk a lot to him. So he tends to filter out some of the stuff I say. And that does at times kind of cause some rifts between us. But we get over it. So he comes home from work and he's tired. Maybe during the weekend he wants to watch a sport, and I'm kind of rattling on, and he will hear a part of what I say, or maybe nothing. So that causes some problems. But once again, we we work it out. Right, but how how does that apply to uh, my theme? Well, that's my criticism of him, that he does not hear me. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the nature of it. Okay. Yeah. So it is an interesting question. How does a woman balance her innate tendency to civilize her husband, to put it in the nicest way, which I think is true, and believing that uh, on occasion silence is the is the better part of valor? Is there a struggle in the female in that regard? Let's see. What do we have here? No, what do we have? Mostly men. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) Very interesting. Male-female hour. Women criticizing their men. I've used this cartoon, which we'll put up at DennisPrager.com. You'll love it. And why is it built into women to do it? And how does the woman know when to do it and when not to bother? These are all important questions. And it's certainly generally not in the other direction, but it happens. Here's, for example, let's see. Yep, here, Kelly in Santa Clarita, California. Hi. Hi there, Dennis. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. So when I first met my husband, um, one thing that he said to me was, you know, I saw my mom nag my dad, their whole marriage, and I just asked that you don't nag me. So I made it a promise to him that I wasn't going to criticize him and nag him, and I truly don't. It's in my nature, and I have a lot I want to criticize him on. But I kind of just bite my tongue and move on. And what's funny is that he now is the one that, like, finds my faults and points them out to me and criticizes me on the things he sees. And I did ask him one time, like, why do you do that? I find that you do this often. And he told me that he felt 
that it was his role as my husband to make me a better person. And so he felt that if he... Why could, isn't it reciprocal? Well, I I agreed with that. I just didn't think that criticizing him... Or no, 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 but why, why doesn't he think the other way around? Uh, that it's your role to make him a better person? He He does believe that. He does. But I find that when I criticize him, it's not taken well. <laughs> So I avoid doing it because I don't want to cause conflict in our relationship. But I think he he does find are purpose. his critiques of you fair. Um, I think that's hard to say because I get so emotionally involved in the critique that it's hard for me to process it. I think in in a reasonable way because I I really just want him to love me and support me instead of tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> So what would he say if he heard this call? Um, I think that's a good question. I think he would agree with what I'm saying, but probably also have more to add about um, why he's doing it and and that he really does love me, and that's why he's doing it. But he very well may be listening, so I'll find out soon. Yeah, then I want a call from you next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That that will be very interesting. Uh, Minneapolis and Tim, hello. Hey, Dennis. Hi. Um, I think when when you get married, you kind of become an extension and a reflection of each other, um, obviously. And women tend to, at least in America, grow up kind of naturally judging themselves on everything all the time. So when the husband, you know, when they have a husband, that's an extension of them and and they can't help themselves, I don't think. And one thing I believe I've learned about women over the years is they, they like to have something other women want. And if they, if you have some flaws as their husband, then they think they're coming up short with, you know, other women aren't going to want the husband they have. So they just, they just point out those flaws and they, and they can't help themselves because they're really it's a reflection of how they look at themselves to a degree. Well, explain that part. You might be right, but explain it. Um, I, don't, I mean, women are always, you know, they're looking at magazines and what other women are wearing, what other people are doing, what other women are doing, their careers, what they, you know, the money they make, the things they have. They're comparing it all to what they have. And do they have more? Do they have less? Do they have an, as nice of a dress, as nice of jewelry? All that. And then they get married, and now they have this husband who's an extension of them. Does he look as good as he can? Does he look as good as the other husband? Does he have the job like my friend's husband has? They're, it's just a natural comparison and judgment. Not always bad, but it's, it's, a, it's just different than guys. And are, are you are you married? I am married. And does this take place in your marriage? Um, my wife grew up in a home where her mom, as, as your previous caller said, I, I don't know if it was nagging, but there was a lot of, you know, he, he her husband, which would be my wife's dad. Mm-hmm. All right, hold on there. My favorite people is in the studio, Barack Lurie. Barack Lurie is a lawyer and a thinker. And believe it or not, they're not mutually exclusive. (laughs) By the way, in light of that, Barack, it is an interesting question. How many lawyers write books that have nothing to do with law? Wow, I, I've not thought about that. I suppose you got the fiction authors like Scott uh, Grisham and, and otherwise, but in terms of nonfiction, I just don't see it. I uh, don't either. Yeah. That's why when I said that, uh, it occurred to me because 40 years of interviewing people, I don't, re- I'm sure there has been, but I don't remember an yeah. author of a nonfiction book that had nothing to do with law or politics Yeah, that was a lawyer. So you you you're you're a renaissance man. I don't I don't mean I'm not a, you know just throwing fluff here. Uh you care about a lot of subjects. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I don't see the point of being a lawyer uh, if you can't analyze the issues deeply and to apply it to the issues that are the most important issues of our day, whether, whether it's about God uh, and, and the lack of God that we're seeing. We talk about this a lot, Dennis, the, the rise of secularism and, the, the, and godlessness, for that matter. Uh, and I, I see the death of uh, that as a major problem. That's why I wrote my Atheism Kill series. Right, and which then, is terrific. Uh, thank you. And, and then the relationships are, are dying, and that's really killing. And, and now, you know, partly because of your uh, show, Dennis, you talked a lot about how, how many people are not talking to their parents anymore yeah. or vice versa because, God forbid, they voted this uh, man named Donald J. Trump or, or otherwise are conservative, and that's, that's just, just too much for them. And I, I thought, how devastating that must be for those parents. Oh, I, uh, I could hear people, in their voices. People cry, cry on the yeah. air to me, literally cry. Yeah. My heart breaks for them, and it's a crisis. It's, it's a pandemic. Yeah. So I just want to talk about you a little more. Were you always interested in everything? Yes, always. Even as a, an so, 11-year-old. Right. So, I, I you remember. know, it, it corresponds to an increasing belief I have, which is not a great insight, I admit, but it, it's it's been just more keenly felt as I get older. We all have natures. Yeah. Aside from, We all have human nature, but we all have our own natures. And it seems to be present early. Yeah. So... Uh, since you and I both love philosophical questions, this this arose in a, in a discussion I had. You know, I, I do this wonderful podcast with Julie Hartman, Dennis and Julie. So that it, it came up. There are people who naturally tend toward deep questions. You're one of them. I'm one of them. She's one of them. I don't even take credit. I'm, I'm tall. I don't take any credit for my height. It's just <laughs> built in. Right. Right. So, uh, can we make people deeper who are not predisposed? I, I think you can. Uh, we see so many people who are suddenly interested in a, a deep passion of something else. Uh, for me, uh, I mean, it was, it was the law. I suddenly became very interested in the law a long time ago. Uh, but now that I think about it, it was like when I was 11 or 12 years old, I was fascinated with the concept of law enforcement. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I, mean, I wondered, what, what keeps people in line in terms of doing the right thing? Is it just the fear that they might be arrested or fined, or is it something greater? Uh, in other words, if we took away the law, uh, would we still see a civilization that we enjoy today? And that was fascinating to me. And I thought, well, I'll never know. How old were you? you? Know, 11. And that to me was... A big issue for the day, and I, I just I always wanted to study that. Well, that's probably one of the questions that led you to God. That that is exactly what it was. And it, at some point, I began to realize you can make all the laws, all the regulations, uh, all the demands and requirements you can possibly imagine, but you'll never be able to get people to act morally just with the law. You have to have God in the equation; otherwise, you'll make yourself dizzy. Uh, with all the regulations and laws uh, imaginable, and it'll never work. So you'll like this. Uh, people, you, I'm sure you've heard this, follow your heart. Yes. So yeah. I have a great rejoinder, which you have. I don't think you have heard from me, because yeah. it's pretty recent. I, to anyone who says follow your heart, I ask, what if we now got rid of speed limits? And just had signed speed limit. <laughs> yes. Follow your heart. Yes. Oh my God. That it, it, it's so true. Follow your heart. And this is. I, I'm glad you bring up traffic laws, um, because I always ask people, isn't it interesting that the one area of civilization that no one really seems to debate or get agitated about are traffic laws? And and I ask them, do you and do, do people debate this? Do you know, we should not have traffic lights anymore. Nobody says that. We should not have stop signs anymore. Nobody says that. We should not have any speed limits. Nobody says right. that. Defund the yeah, traffic lights. Exactly. <laughs> no, nobody says that. And I I ask them why. We we talk about education, what we should teach them in, in, in schools. We talk about global warming. We talk about minimum wage and affirmative action, but nobody talks about traffic laws. And and here's the answer. Because when you make a mistake in the traffic laws, when you violate the law, the consequences are immediate, 
right? You run that red light, you will get in a big crash, right? So everyone recognizes right away that this is what happens when you don't That's have traffic lights. an excellent point. Lights. Whereas yeah. so much else, it's a delayed consequence. Right. You don't see the result. That's and, right. and you can say, well, I, I, yes. I attribute the... Uh, That's the whole, the whole green agenda. Right. Exactly right. So who knows when, you know, what, what we can blame or give credit to in the green agenda or, for that matter, affirmative action. Uh, you know, I, I think affirmative action has been incredibly destructive. Right. Uh, it's, the party of irony is what I call the Democrat Party because everything they do uh, ends up doing exactly the opposite of what they intend. So, but, but it's so much time has passed that they can't necessarily narrow it down as you would if you ran through a red light. You ran the red light, you killed that man. That's the reason why. So this man has written on atheism, God, sex robots, <laughs> and now keeping the kids all right, how to empower your children against the leftist agenda without homeschooling. Whoa. <laughs> I know you're a big fan of homeschooling. I am. And I, and I well, am too. I'm sure you are too. I, I oh, am yeah, very much how so. How could you not be? Right. But for those But obviously who... most people aren't going to do it. Right. For those who don't do it or, or are afraid to do it or whatever it is, you have to have a system in place where you don't have to worry about the madness that they're teaching the, the kids. How do you do that? I, I make the analogy of a hurricane hunter plane, right? These are the hurricane hunter planes that go through hurricanes and they don't get agitated. They don't get phased at all, right? They just study the weather and then they come back. How do you make your kid like a hurricane hunter plane? That's a good analogy. In this hurricane of our civilization today, of our culture. And, and I, I was fascinated with this because the last thing I want are my kids because I have young kids. How many kids do you have? Three. And what uh, are their ages? Eight, 18, a boy 18, girl 15, and a young boy 11. Have they had any temptations to wokeism? No. No, because I developed the system a long time ago. I, I saw that this would be happening. Uh, I didn't expect the transgenderism madness, but still the, the whole concept was there. Global warming, the evolution, uh, the idea that America is a terrible country somehow. Uh, I wanted to get ahead of that. And I want to make sure that my kids never have to deal with this. I never want to be, you know, after the fact, having to deal with the, these uh, woke issues. So, no, they've never been tempted. Uh, they never will be tempted. They are rock-solid conservatives. They love America. They love God. Uh, and they laugh at all the woke issues. Laugh they probably it. even love you. <laughs> they, I think they do. <laughs> I think they do. <laughs> uh, we, you know, I, put, with, I have a lot of challenges with them as well. I do a lot of mountain biking. So during mountain biking, when you're out in the trails, you get to talk a lot. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, look, this, this program, Keeping the Kids when All Right. When did you become aware that you needed to do this? Oh, uh, before my first child was born. Really? Yeah, I, I, I saw it right away. You were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Well, look, I, I went to college. I went to a very liberal college, and I saw how... Where? At Stanford. It was very, very uh, liberal at the time. By the it, way, is Stanford the S-bomb like Harvard is the H-bomb? <laughs> I, I don't know what I, I know what you mean by that. Well, that's the uh, Harvard graduates refer to it as the H-bomb. They know if they say, I, I, I'm at Harvard or I went to Harvard. Oh, I see. It sort of changes the, the dynamic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it is. The S-bomb, I guess it is. If you say you went to Stanford, it definitely changes the dynamic. I, I generally speaking will say when I went to college. Like, you did okay, that. Yeah. No, you did that. That's why I was very curious. Yeah. Yeah, because if you say you went to Stanford, then they say, oh, why is he saying he went to Stanford? That's but, right. But if I went to University of Puget Sound, which is a great school, uh, nobody would say, oh, well, what an arrogant uh, SOB. He said he right, went to. Right, right. Uh, anyway, so that's the answer to why that. Why don't you study at Stanford? Economics and humanities. A very we'll be, all right. The book, Keeping the Kids All Right, Preparing Them for Wokeism, as it were. The book is up at DennisPrager.com. You can order it at Amazon. Keeping the Kids All Right. with a, uh, a real thinker, Barack Lurie, who is also a lawyer, and an excellent lawyer, I might add. The book, the latest, I mean, given the, uh, the variety of issues you address, I, I wouldn't be surprised if your next book will be Great Shortstops. <laughs> so, yes, that would be surprising. But you know, they're all related to books. They're all, they all kind of center well, let me around say the, the God name. issue. I want to sell your book. Yeah. Keeping the Kids All Right, 
How to empower your children against the leftist agenda without homeschooling. Keeping the kids all right. Barack Lurie, L-U-R-I-E. Go ahead. Thank you. I, look, all the books center around God, one way or the other. Uh, this book, even, Keeping the Kids All Right, is, is about how we need to embrace God, God fullness, God in our culture, God in our, with our kids. If you don't have that, uh, then they, they lack purpose. And that's one of the key aspects of uh, this book. Well, yeah, because bring the, their in. purpose will be filled with with fighting uh, on behalf of gender uh, care. <laughs> that's right. And, and on behalf of ruining the economy for green I- reasons. That's exactly right. They, everyone needs a purpose, and you've got to give them purpose. That, so that's, that's right. You have, a pas- you have a chapter, Purpose and Passion. Yeah. Yeah. K- kids need passion. They need purpose. And you and so what, as a what, parent, what that's one of your first in that jobs. Regard? What did you do? Oh, I, I, I made sure that they understood uh, who God is and why God is so significant in their lives. That life is meaningless without God. Uh, that you can achieve fantastic By the way, things. I just want to just forgive me. I want to just make sure that my listeners understand. That's not an opinion. Yeah. That life is meaningless without God is not opinion. And every atheist philosopher that I know of acknowledges that. That's right. That's right. There's no God. We are a coincidence. We're random chance. And we're here for a blink, a a half a blink. And then for eternity, it's over. (laughs) That's exactly right. And I, I ask those people, by the way, especially when they have kids, I say, why did you have kids? What's the point? And they'll say, they, they pause because they never really thought about that. Uh, well, I have to continue my values, they say. And I said, well, what values? Values don't matter. And why, why do you care whether they continue your values? What does that matter at all? And especially if you become nothing after you die. So I know why I have kids. I, I have kids because it's an obligation on the one hand, and it's a joy that God gives me on the other. That's the reason why. And I want to have as many kids as I can. Uh, God will. I wish we had six kids. We have three, but nevertheless, uh, that's the reason why you have kids, and God rewards you. By for the way, there's kids. a proof to that too. Yeah. Secular people are not reproducing like religious people. It's not comparable. Right, right. I, I'd like to see a movie in the future, uh, one day, Dennis, where it takes place, let's say, in the year 2063, uh, 40 years from now. And, and you look into the future and look, look at America, and they look around, they see all sorts of conservative signs everywhere, flags everywhere, Donald Trump was the greatest president, et cetera, uh, the churches everywhere, and, and the guy coming from the year 2023 says, wow, what happened? I can't believe it. It's some sort of cataclysmic event. And his friend says, no, it just you guys just didn't have any kids. <laughs> and we... We had a lot of kids. And then you're surprised that everything's conservative. Barack, do you know I wrote a column. I was so moved. And I did a show. There was a piece in the New York Times about a year ago where in, I don't remember if it was a male or female, writing about how it's uh, inadvisable to have children given climate change. Right. Why would you want to bring a child into existential threats That means it threats to the existence of humanity. Right. All right. So I always read the comments, and all the comments there are New York Times subscribers. So I actually wrote a column on how many said as follows. Well, to be honest, I really, really, all of my life wanted grandchildren. But I agree with my daughter's decision not to have a child because of global warming. I remember one uh, one of your episodes where they a grandmother spoke exactly to that point, and it was so heartbreaking to me, for her sake, and I think also for the daughter's sake, who has decided not to have kids, because she will regret later on. She will regret, and and that's the problem is that they they Im- imagine this concept of this abyss, but in, in addition to that, Dennis, they they think that by having a child, that that child is also uh, just eating up resources of the planet and also spewing out carbon dioxide, which contributes to global warming, right? So this is their thinking and not realizing, well, what if everyone thought this way? What if everyone decided not to have I a kid? I think uh, uh, there was another piece in the New York Times. That's my source for woke ideas. <laughs> yes. And there was a piece a couple of years ago that it would not be a calamity if humanity stopped reproducing. Yeah. 
So your question, they it is not rhetorical. They'd be fine with that. The, yes, they'd yeah. be fine with that. Yeah, it's uh, there's something called natalism to that very issue, where they it's a movement to not have humankind anymore, yeah. to not have kids at all. Uh, and and this is kind of the inversion. This is the the new default that you'll be seeing. That as you have kids, they will look at you as the devil. That you are selfish for having kids. You are a bad person. You may be even selfish evil. for having a car, having kids, uh, for eating meat. Yes, I mean it. Every joy in life yeah. is is to be undone. Yeah. But they, but they don't see the consequences. We talked about this before, but all the things they had said before, including population control, uh, the, the big population bomb of the 1970s, right, the early 70s with Paul Ehrlich and his book, and how wrong he was. I mean, he said that uh, the, the whole planet, and I have this in my book, by the way, is one of the talking points that parents can use with their kids, that there will be no more sea life in, in the oceans by the year 1990. Uh, and then to say nothing of the fact they would all be starving and be eating each other like Soylent Green in that movie. So they were wrong there, but they don't, they don't seem to understand that, that the conservatives, we think expansively. There's always innovation on the horizon. The Democrats, the, the lefts in particular, they think restrictively, always in terms of limitation. They can't imagine a world where things might be different, right? What, what if? We, you know, to them, it's still uh, the Iceman, the days of the Iceman or the, the horse and buggy sort of guys. They can't imagine a world beyond that, that maybe somehow we'll be able to, to go beyond. That's a good, food. a limited vision versus an expansive. It's yeah. true. The book, my friends, and if you want to call in about raising kids, one eight Prager 776 keeping the kids all right, how to empower your children against the leftist agenda, Barack Lurie. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.